Yeah, I think from yes. KSCAP's office, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Respected uh, dignitaries, invitees, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and welcome you all to the inaugural lecture of Bengaluru India Nano Talks 2022. As a part of this inaugural lecture, a very brief inaugural session has been organized. At the outset, I request Sri A.B. Basaraju, sir, Director, Technical Department of Electronics, IT, BT, and Science and Technology, and Managing Director of KSTEPS to welcome the dignitaries and participants to today's webinar session. Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to Bangalore India Nano session. Honorable Minister for Higher Education, Electronics, IT, BT, Skill Development, Government of Karnataka, Dr. C. N. Aspatnayan, sir. Uh, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, Professor Ajay Kumar, so, sir. Additional Chief Secretary to Government Department of Electronics, IT, BT, Science and Technology, Government of Karnataka, uh, Sri E. V. Ramana Reddy, sir. Chairman of Vision Group on Nanotechnology, Dean Division of Interdisciplinary Science, IASC, Professor Naukan Bhatt. President of JNC, sir, and today's speaker of uh, Bangalore India Nano Tax 2022, Professor Giridhar Yukulkarni, Professor Anind Das, uh, convener of Bangalore India Nano Tax 2022, uh, Associate Professor of Department of Physics, IAC, distinguished uh, participant, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it, is a, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all for today's inaugural talk of uh, Bangalore India Nano Tax 2022. The government of Karnataka over the years has been giving a greater importance to the growth of science and technology, including nanotechnology in the state. All such effort is organizing a Bangalore India Nano, a flagship uh, nano event since 2007 under the chairman's, under the guidance of Bharat Ratna Professor CN Rao, chairman of Vision Group on Nanotechnology, honorary president of JNCSR. Till now, 12 editions of the event have been organized successfully. This event has been providing an excellent platform to bring together nano, nanotech research, industry, government, and academia successfully over the last uh, decade. Further to engage the nano community uh, throughout the year, a Bangalore India Nano Monthly webinar series being organized from this year as a platform to reach out a large audience, including younger generation from universities and colleges, and keep them connected to the Bangalore India Nano brand. Apart from this webinars, apart from this webinar, <laughs> Webinar series. A monthly webinar talk with eminent nano, nano expert is being organized by Karnataka Science and Technology Promotion Society as an autonomous organization under the Department of Electronics, IT, BT, Science and Technology, Government of Karnataka. KSTEPS acts as a nodal agency for the preparation and implementation of policy initiatives of the Department of Science and Technology and channelizing the funding and coordinating the programs of the department across the state. It is also being interested to identify the priority areas of science and technology, which are useful for the long-term development of the state towards the developing core competency in advanced areas, including nanotechnology. As a nanotechnology is a rapidly growing technology, it is a paramount importance to disseminate the recent developments in the nano field. In this context, I call upon the nano community, including younger generations in colleges and university, to make the best use of this platform to share and gain knowledge in the field of nanotechnology. I once again welcome you all. Thank you, Honorable President Chair. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. C. N. Ashwat Narayan, sir, Honorable Minister for Higher Education, Electronics, IT, BT, and SNT, Skill Development, Entrepreneurship, and Livelihood Government of Karnataka for the opening remarks. My best wishes to all the dignitaries. On the occasion of the inaugural of Bengaluru India Nano Talk 2022, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Ajay Kumar Sood, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India, Dr. E. V. Ramana Reddy, Additional Chief Secretary to Government of Karnataka, Department of Electronics, ITBT, and Science and Technology. Professor Navakant Bhatt, Chairman of Vision Group on Nanotechnology, Dean, Division of Interdisciplinary Science, Indian Institute of Science. Professor Giridhar U. Kulkarni, President of JN uh, Jawaharlal Nehru uh, Center for Advanced and Science and Research, and the inaugural speaker of the Bangalore India Nano Talks 2022. Sri A. B. Basaraj, Director, Technical and Managing Director, 
K Steps, Department of Electronics, ITBT, and Science and Technology. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to welcome welcome you to the webinar on the Bengaluru India Nano 2022 inaugural talk. It is always stimulating and an enjoyable experience for me to be part of any science and technology related activities in the state. Karnataka has become a pioneering state in the country to give impetus for the growth of nanotechnology through the organization of the Bengaluru India Nano event. Since 2007, under the guidance of Bharat Ratna Professor CNR Rao, Chairman of Vision Group on Nanotechnology, Honorary President of Jalnal Naru Center of Advanced Scientific Research Center, Bengaluru India Nano, India's annual flagship event is in a prestigious nanotech event of the country and it has emerged as the leading and the most soft after international nanotech event, which is on the radar of many countries across the globe. I am very happy to note that under the guidance of Vision, Vision Group on Nanotechnology, the Bengaluru India Nano monthly webinar series is being organized as a platform to reach out to a larger audience and keep them connected to the Bengaluru India Nano brand. I understand that nanotechnology has emerged as a versatile platform that offers disruptive, game-changing breakthroughs and innovation to provide efficient, cost-effective and environmentally acceptable solution to the global sustainability challenges faced by the society. As nanotechnology has the potential to create job opportunities and contribute significantly to the economy of our state. Our government wished to bring out a nanotechnology policy or a strategy on similar lines brought out for other knowledge-based sectors to facilitate the growth of this sunrise industry in the state. I hope that similar to information technology and biotechnology, the state will become a hub for the nanotech industry. As there is a rapid progress in this emerging field, one has to keep abreast of the recent development, challenges and application of nanotechnology. I consider that a program like this will provide enough opportunities for researchers, faculty and students working in the field of nanotechnology and related fields to interact for knowledge sharing and exchange of ideas. I hope the Bengaluru India Nano Webinar 2022 provides an opportunity for eminent nano experts to share their research experience and indulge in interactive discussions. I thank the Vision Group on Nanotechnology for this great initiative and look forward to many more initiatives for the growth of nano industry in the state. I wish you all a very successful webinar. Namaskara. Jai in Jai Karnataka. Thank you very much, sir. I now request Professor Ajay Kumar Sood, sir, the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India to address the participants. Professor Sood, you are muted. Yeah, Professor Sood. Professor Sood, you are. Uh... Yes. Am I am I audible now? Yeah, yes, we can hear now. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, okay, I, I was just saying it's a indeed a great pleasure for me to be able to be a part of this event, uh, which I was not very sure in the beginning because of some conflicting meeting, uh, where this year new initiative is being launched. And it has, it is seeing the participation of uh, many dignitaries like Honorable Minister uh, Dr. Ashwad Narayan, uh, Dr. Ramna Reddy, Dr. Basuraj, President Navkan Bhatt, uh, uh, President India Das, and of course our uh, bridegroom of the day, uh, President G.U. Kulkarni, who is really launching uh, with this uh, inaugural talk. So I think a lot, I mean, already we have uh, heard what, why this event is important, but uh, it will not harm to re-emphasize that uh, Bangalore India Nano, which started in a small way almost 12 years back, 
has become a flagship event of the Karnataka government. And uh, in my view, Karnataka government is a role model uh, in, the, uh, in our country where we see a wonderful synergy between research, uh, technology, innovation, and government support. This is these four pillars of any ecosystem. It's not very easy to come by. And uh, I, uh, this is again the right place to repeat that uh, this is very unique. And I would like to congratulate Karnataka government once again uh, for being so proactive and really taking the uh, torch of science and technology to the masses. Uh, this morning, we had the PM Stike meeting uh, uh, in uh, our, which our office is, uh, I chair that, which went on for about six hours. And I, one of the item again was uh, One Health Mission. Uh, one Health means cutting across humans, animals, wildlife, environment. And again, extraordinarily important mission. And I was very pleased to see that when uh, Secretary Min Ministry of Animal Husbandry was making the intervention, he did point out that the two states uh, Karnataka and another state are really participating in a uh, 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 project, uh, test project along this line, uh, along this uh, One Health mission. So again, this is another example where Karnataka government is showing the leadership. They are showing the leadership in uh, semiconductor uh, ecosystem, which has been announced by the government. We already are uh, 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 reading about the huge investment that is likely to come. So all that augurs very well uh, to really promote uh, R&D uh, ecosystem in uh, Karnataka state and, and, and India. So uh, I have no doubt that this year long events which will go on will keep the uh, uh, excitement on the nano science going. Usually, we used to meet once in one year, or sometimes we met once in two years, two day event, which is always sought after Bangalore India Nano. But now uh, we will have uh, such uh, interaction events uh, on uh, almost monthly basis. And uh, if the need be, it can be made once in two weeks if there is a enormous interest. And we have very many wonderful speakers lined up. And so I think it uh, all gels very well to uh, bring home the point that uh, when there is so much support from the uh, state leadership, it can do wonders. So, uh, so I would like to uh, congratulate here our uh, Honorable Minister who just inaugurated this and uh, Dr. E.V. Ramana Reddy, uh, who is here with us uh, this evening to really uh, uh, say thank you and uh, look forward to uh, this continued support to this SNT system in the, in the state. And that also goes a long way for the country. So it is all integral part. And uh, thanks to Anindya that he is anchoring this. By the way, now he's the full professor. Somebody says associate professor. No, he's the full professor. There is a correction. Correct, Anindya? No, no, I no. I'm, st no I'm still associate professor. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you, Anindya. But uh, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, I am happy I'm able to join. And uh, I'll see if uh, uh, this uh, conflict is not there with my program. I look forward to join uh, subsequent events as and when possible. So, Navkan, thank you so much for your leadership. And uh, I'm sure uh, we will go a long way in uh, nurturing our young talent uh, spread across the uh, state and the country to uh, be excited about. Thank you. And thank you for having me here.
Thank you very much, sir, for addressing the participant in spite of your busy schedule. Now I request Dr. E. V. Ramana Reddy, sir, Associate Secretary to Government, Department of Electronics, IT, BT, and SNT, to address the participant. Dr. C. N. Ashwath Narayan, Honorable Minister for Electronics, IT, BT, SNT, Higher Education and Skill Development, Professor Ajay K. Sood, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Professor Navakant Bhatt, Chairman VGNT, Government of Karnataka, and Dean, Division of Interdisciplinary Sciences, Professor Sens, IASC Bangalore, Professor Giridhar Kulkarni, President of Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Professor Anindya Das, Mr. Basavaraju, Dr. Venkatesha, and all the participants from various universities and colleges. Firstly, though it is already two and a half months, I would like to congratulate Professor Ajay K. Sood for being taken over as the position of uh, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. And I wish you all the best, sir. And I hope you will make a good uh, beginning and uh, you will make rich contributions to the scientific community of uh, India. Thank you very and, much. Thank, thank, you, you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I am happy to be present at this inaugural function of the Bangalore India Nano Talks. As all of you know, all Karnataka has a very solid base of science and technology and research and development. Not only in public sector undertakings like ISRO and DRDO centers and National Aeronautic Laboratory and different other public sector undertakings, but we always boast of 400 global capability centers in uh, Bangalore and Karnataka of various multinational companies from world over. In fact, in the morning, we had a meeting with the uh, South Korean ambassador there. He was proudly mentioning that Samsung has their second largest R&D center outside their headquarters in Bangalore. Similarly, many multinational big, big companies have their largest R&D centers outside their headquarters in Bangalore. So that is the USP and that is the strength of Bangalore that we have not only public sector uh, great R&D centers, but even the private sector, everybody is coming to Bangalore to set up their largest R&D centers. And we are also proud of our Indian Institute of Science, which is more than 100 years old and uh, which is number one university in the country. And realizing the, as uh, Professor Sood has said, realizing the importance of nanotechnology in fact, Karnataka government has formed the vision group on nanotechnology in 2007 itself to create some kind of congenial atmosphere for the nanotechnology industry to grow in the state. Again, Bangalore India Nano event, the flagship event was started in 2007 to provide a platform for researchers, industry and academia to exchange their knowledge and ideas. And under the able guidance of uh, Professor Sienna Rao, Professor Rajay Sood, Professor Navkant, but in fact, we had very good events in the last few years and last event also, we have seen very good participation from many of the international, uh, uh, we had many international participants. I'm happy to note that Vision Group on Nanotechnology under the honorary chairmanship of Professor Bharat Ratna Siyana Rao and Chairmanship of Naukan but have initiated this another new initiative called Bangalore India Nano Web Webinar Series, which will act as a platform to reach out to the larger audience. In the Nano event, though we may have once in a year, two, three days, but we would be reaching a limited audience. But by this, by having continuous uh, nano web series, we will be able to reach all colleges and universities in a large number and also on a continuous basis. Hence, I take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt thanks from the government of Karnataka to Bharat Ratna Professor Siyana Rao, Professor Ajay Kumar Sood, PSA to the government of India, and especially to Professor Navkant Bhatt for thinking of such an initiative and uh, starting this initiative. I hope the younger generations from the universities and colleges will make use of this platform. And I wish Bangalore India Nano Talks 2022 a great success. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
I now request Professor Naukant Bhatt sir to introduce today's speaker, Professor Giridhar Yukulkarni. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I'll just take a couple of minutes to firstly, you know, thank uh, Professor Ajay Sur. We started this idea during the last band of Nano, and we continued our discussions. And I'm very glad to see that it has come to fruition. And particularly today, despite his busy schedule with PMC Act meeting. He has made it a point to join us. So I really thank you for such um, Also, uh, Dr. Ramana Reddy, you know, additional chief secretary has been a pillar of support for all technological activities in the context of electronics, IT, BT, and NT. And, uh, you know, we really look forward for your continued support in the coming years as well. And uh, finally, case steps has been amazing. You know, I. When I send an email, I get an instant response. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Sri Basu Raju Venkatesha and all the staff. You know, uh, you have been uh, supporting this uh, activity, especially this webinar series, in a very short time. You have uh, supported Prasan India in all logistics. Uh, thank you, and that brings me to thank uh, Prasan India, who will sort of spearhead this uh, webinar series. Uh, and we hope to build a very strong repository of these uh, uh, lectures. We would be recording this and you know, this will be made available for future reference also on the Bengaluru Nano India uh, website. So that is how we would be able to sort of strengthen and build this brand even further. So with that, let me come to today's webinar. Uh, we have a great uh, speaker today. Uh, Professor uh, Giridhar U. Kulkarni, uh, eminent scientist, technologist, and a science administrator. He is currently president of Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in Bengaluru. Professor Kulkarni obtained his uh, PhD from uh, IASC under the guidance of Professor CNR Rao, Bharat Ratna, who is not able to join uh, today. Uh, that was in 1992, he got his PhD and then he uh, did his postdoctoral research initially at IASC and then at Cardiff University on a Unilever project. He then joined uh, JNCASR in 1995 as faculty fellow and is now president of JNCASR and professor in the materials unit. He also served as director of uh, Center for Nano and Soft Matter Sciences, Bengaluru, during 2015 to 2021. Over the years, Professor Kulkarni has held visiting adjunct professor positions at many universities globally, including Purdue University in the US. He's a fellow of Indian National Science Academy, fellow of National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Sciences, and Indian Academy of Science and also honorary fellow of Karnataka Science and Technology Academy. He's a member of NAC General Council and UGC's Consortium for Academic Research and Ethics Committee, Empowered Committee. Professor Kulkarni has received several honors and awards during his illustrious career. Notable among them include Sir C. V. Raman Young Scientist Award, Dr. Raja Ramana State Award, Bengaluru Nano Award, Shastra CNR Rao Award for Excellence in Chemistry and Material Sciences, and Karnataka State Rajot Sava Award. With that, uh, in addition, of course, he has supervised several PhD students and uh, master students and has many, many general publications. And you know, he recently has also uh, forayed into startups and related technological translational activities. So with that, uh, over to you, Professor Kulkan. This is a small announcement regarding the question and answer. Uh, so we have a, a question and answer session at the end of the talk. So, uh, so there is a request to all uh, audience and participants that they can uh, post their questions in the chat box, as well as they can raise their hand. Uh, so we'll try to address at least a uh, few of them in a given time. Okay, with this, yeah, uh, please, Professor Kulkandi. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Butt, for the kind, <coughs> kind introduction. I'm glad to be with you all uh, at the launch of this uh, event, Bangalore India Nano Talks 2022. 
uh, Anindya, am I audible clearly? Yeah, you are you're audible. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes Professor Kandu. So on this occasion, I express uh, <clears throat> my sincere gratitude to Professor Siena Rao for all his support, guidance, and mentorship over the years, over the decades. I will sincerely thank VGNT, the organizers, for this kind invitation. Thank you, Professor Sood. I know how super busy you are, but in spite of that, uh, you are participating. I should be grateful. Thank you, Professor Bhatt, for the invitation. <clears throat> And um, it is truly an honor. I'm really touched by this because this is the maiden talk of the series and I have been chosen. I don't know. There are so many other names. And so it makes me feel very humble, actually. And um, from the government, which is extremely appreciable, uh, we just heard uh, Dr. Ashok Narayan speaking to us on the occasion and also Dr. Ramana Reddy is around. So it is again a great honor to give uh, a talk uh, in front of such audience joined by, uh, I was told lots of students and uh, uh, colleagues from various universities and colleges. A big thank you to, to all of you. Let me try share the screen now. And uh, Professor Bhatt, it is now 5.56. I think we are running a bit late, maybe 10, 12 minutes or so. Uh, and um, I'll keep an eye on the time and uh, you or Anindya can alert me at the end of my 40th minute. That will be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Anindya will do that. Yeah. Thank you. I will go for sharing of the screen. I have just recovered from some fever. <laughs> I hope uh, I will not be excessively perspiring through the talk. Um, Please check whether the uh, sharing has taken yeah, place. Yeah, we can see that the full screen. Yeah. And now check whether the uh, screen is full of the slide. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. See, <clears throat> when uh, <clears throat> I am not able, but I am not able to see the slides. Right? Or maybe there is some delay because we are able to see it. Uh, oh, it's the Bangalore. Uh, <laughs> Bangalore. <laughs> <laughs> How is it, Professor Sud? It's good. Still? Started screen sharing, but I'm not seeing it. Ah, oh, now I can see. Sorry, sorry. Now it so has come. That, that is very true. Then the distance matters. <laughs> yeah. It is also called Dher hai and Dher nahi hai. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. Yeah, but fine. now it's very clear. Thank you. Good, good. So I must tell you the background why I have chosen this topic. We work on a couple of areas, uh, three, four areas pertaining to nanoscience tech, you know, related to twisted graphene or making uh, uh, gold particles in a different lattice. Lots of interesting results we do have in the group. But I thought I'll choose a topic uh, which could be of general interest. Given that this is an evening talk, I didn't want to bore the, uh, you know, bring boredom to the audience with lots of technicalities. I hope experts uh, do not mind this. And this is going to be sort of a uh, you know, talk lighter in terms of, uh, you know, uh, technicalities and all. But of course, there is a uh, good uh, uh, question answer session in the end. So you're most welcome to ask questions. And you can also bother me later or email or whatever. So the topic is uh, functional glass for smart windows. And um, I'll try to, yes, I was not able to see my slide entirely. Now I'm able to see. Okay, so let's move on. <clears throat> uh -huh. Oh, slide is not moving. I have to re-enter, looks like. Oh. Sometimes it happens. Maybe you can just, uh, uns is it frozen, your screen? Ah, now it's okay. Yeah. Uh, just re share once okay. again. Yeah. You Shall I, should I actually stop sharing? Should I share? No, some, yeah, sometimes the system is a net, I guess, a network issue, but just re share again, I think it will be okay. Sir, you can re share it, sir. Yeah, it has come. It's can come. you please check whether it's going to next slide? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay, at last. So uh, we are talking about glass, uh, glass everyone knows. So I'll just. Uh, 
uh, collate uh, what ha what have been the efforts in the last uh, several centuries uh, since mankind started using glass. So that is the uh, first part I'll be touching upon uh, in the in the minutes to come. And then how nanotechnology has influenced the way we look at glass and the way we make use of glass. And then on, um, I will introduce the concept of smart window and what existing technologies are around, what products are available, and where exactly are the technology gaps, and uh, what efforts we have made in the group to bridge these gaps. So we are also exploring lots of new ideas, and that takes me to the summary of the whole talk. I would like to, I aim to finish it in probably 37, 40 minutes or so. <clears throat> so glass, as we all know for the sake of students, these are silicate materials, highly covalent system, and uh, wide band gap semiconductors. So once they crystallize, actually, they are actually super cold. You, know, you don't call it as crystallization. From the melt, they are super cold to retain that disorderliness, which is very important. And once the glass is formed, there is nothing much to talk about. The surface is actually, surface is actually completely saturated and the glass remains uh, entirely inert. And that's one reason it is being used everywhere, you know, whether it is uh, with respect to the uh, cooking vessels or uh, uh, cover to the building or in satellites and, you know, everywhere glass is being used because of its chemical inertness. And uh, the kind of smoothness it achieves. There are very many reasons why you should exhibit uh, those properties, but let me not get into those. One, again, important property I just mentioned is the wide band gap semiconductor. So uh, glass being that, it can actually transmit the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And that's why it is transparent. So this is the glass. And uh, there's hardly anything one can be doing with it because it is so inert. Uh, you have to plan uh, doing anything with it uh, during the glass formation itself. And that is something people learned long ago, several centuries ago. We have heard of these uh, colored, colored glasses in uh, ancient structures and all that. So combining ideas from metallurgy and glass making, people learned that if they shove in a bit of metal during the glass formation, there's a possibility of getting it colored. Probably those days, uh, the, the foundry people didn't understand why the color is coming up. Today we understand it is it could be because of the metal particles getting dispersed in the glass matrix, in a dialectic matrix, and uh, the local plasmons and all uh, end up, uh, you know, interacting with the light and that brings in extra absorption and coloration to glass and whatnot. So without much knowledge about what's happening, people did learn and actually come up with very fancy uh, you know, colored glasses for windows and all that. The you know literature is actually filled with uh, lots of such examples. And much later, people learned that they could be actually adding um, uh, inorganic entities like iron oxide or some sulfur-containing compound. Oh, uh, 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 and then uh, ah, you could actually uh, control the kind of color what could what the glass could be uh, showing. So again, this uh, field is extremely rich and I will not be able to spend any time on that. Off late, in the last few decades, the growth of uh, glass technology is all around how to actually uh, modify the glass surface. Uh, you know, you want to bring in a polymeric film coating or some molecular coating and whatnot. So today we have this uh, famous material PVB, uh, which actually can work as thermal insulation. It can bring in soundproof type of qualities for the glass. It can also make glass shatterproof. You know, it's a windshield used in automobiles. So these examples are all abound uh, in, in the uh, internet. I didn't really pull out any scientific literature. There are actually products available. I have given some sites, though I'm not really advertising for those companies, but there are equally a uh, lot of widespread uh, uh, commercial usage of this. Well, off late, much later, you know, since the advent of uh, nanotechnology last, uh, say, two decades, glass has been again re is being revisited. That is, how to make glass <coughs> dust repelling or become much more scratch proof. And again, each one is a field by itself. I'm not getting into those areas. I'll just give one example of how to make a glass uh, anti fog. Uh, whenever you have humidity variation in the atmosphere, glass can actually attract moisture and you will see tiny droplets getting formed. And uh, unless one mechanically, physically cleans it up, uh, this fog, what gets formed on the glass, condensation of water, it doesn't go away. So if we keep the glass itself 
functionally active in a way that you can actually avoid water condensation, then it's called anti-fogging glass. And silica nanoparticles have been shown to play a big role, not just the pristine silica nanoparticles coated with PVA, and it brings in extra these hydrophobic properties, and uh, such glasses have been shown to have very special properties. Similarly, uh, bringing in antibacterial coating on glass, antibacterial coating is all around. I mean, there are lots of different examples. And uh, this particular publication, just, just an example from literature, uh, they used uh, silver nanoparticles in a controlled way and without really affecting the optical transparency of the glass, they could actually bring in the antibacterial coating and study how the, uh, uh, the efficacy of these uh, bacterial uh, uh, culture, how does it grow and you know whether it can be contained and all those. So these have been termed as antibacterial coating and nowadays even antiviral coatings are also available. So this is, this is how the nanotech has moved forward uh, taken forward the uh, glass technology and uh, <clears throat> but i will only be focusing as i said on one particular aspect and that is got to do with smart windows okay and as you, i don't have to explain you what is a smart window you can see the picture there as given the source below there this is actually a commercial product and here is a meeting hall which is covered with uh, uh, glass panes huge glass panes and you instantly you can switch the transparency. You can make it uh, go into opaque or translucent state, wherein it will just give you scattered light. You will not be able to see something uh, from outside. And uh, when you uh, switch back, it can actually allow the transparency itself. So these kind of glasses are to be called as uh, functional glasses for smart window applications. They can also be used not just for windows, but also internal partitions as well. Why this is important? You see on the uh, other side, I'll try to turn on the pointer here. Mm. Yes, yeah. You see this typical drawing, these are all from, uh, you know, internet, uh, wherever possible, I have acknowledged uh, the sources. You see here, <clears throat> energy consumption in office buildings. This is how people represent, right? What is this uh, HVAC, the air conditioning, ventilation, you know, you need air circulation, you want the light to come in, but you want to control the temperature of the light and also humidity of the uh, temperature of the air and also humidity of the air. So this is very challenging, actually. And uh, and also the uh, artificial lighting. Together, you can see that the total building uh, energy, if you audit the energy, uh, it's close to around 60% of the energy goes from that. Uh, much similar numbers one can get for domestic uh, scenario also. And only a very small fraction is for the real applications, equipment, or whatever. So much of the energy is drained out in terms of maintaining a workable environment inside a, something closed enclosure, whatever. It could be internal partition. It could be a big meeting hall, auditorium, or whatever. So a lot of energy goes in there. And uh, many a times, of course, I mean, I'm not saying that you can uh, you, you cannot depend on air conditioners at all. All that I'm saying is where possible, where there's a good light, we should be able to let the light in and reduce the cost on, on lighting itself. And you know, when it's too bright, actually cutting down the light can help uh, save energy with respect to running of the air conditioning itself. So there are multiple linked aspects here, and uh, I will not get into the uh, you know, technology management aspect here, but just to emphasize that the matter is actually intricate. So one is to use the, uh, bring in a control for ambient light entry, and that's what towards energy saving. And you want to have it on demand. I mean, it should not behave on its own. You know, there should be a switch, on or off switch, controllable switch, accordingly which the glass has to function. And uh, you could also use it as a privacy window, right? So internal partition, for example, we see lots of glass being used for internal partitioning of uh, lobbies and even inside the uh, private rooms in the hotels. So there also these partitioning uh, functional glasses can play a big role. And the literature is filled with lots of examples. See, this, this is a huge uh, meeting hall can be instantly made uh, uh, translucent. I mean, you can't see what's happening inside. So such examples are there very much in the literature. <clears throat> I'm not going to give you a comprehensive review of the technologies existing given the time limitation. I'll just touch upon important four technologies. That is, one is thermochromic uh, mechanism, how it is uh, being exploited in creating a technology. And then a suspended particle, 
uh, where uh, the particles actually uh, uh, could be interacting with the light and that's how they influence the transparency. And a variation of that could be these polymer dispersed liquid crystal uh, type of devices and uh, lastly electrochromic ion intercalation leading to color change. So these four I'll, by way of taking some, uh, again, something from the internet, I'll try to illustrate here. So in the thermochromic, typically it is the vanadium oxide. Vanadium oxide works pretty close to the ambient temperature. Uh, the transition temperature is around 70 degrees or so. And if you do dope it suitably, it can actually brought down to almost ambient temperatures. So when the temperature is varied, you can see the, uh, the picture below, uh, when there's a bright light, like in the afternoon, the whole glass gets tinted. So it actually controls the, the harsh light entry. It really, it's like wearing a cooling glass. And then in the morning and evening hours, when there's hardly any light, actually it can become transparent. <coughs> this is something where vanadium oxide goes on changing by itself. Uh, it doesn't need energy, but you have hardly any control over it. So people have found a limited use with it. Of course, it finds use in terms of open facades, the kind of example what I have shown there. It can't be used uh, in a programmed way wherever you want to have your own control. And so it does find applications, but it has limited applications. The advantage is that you're not spending any energy here. It runs on its own. Uh, next one is <clears throat> a suspended particle design. Here, what is done is, uh, uh, you know, you have essentially a sandwich device. You have two glass panes and they are coated with a conducting layer, electrically conducting layer. I'll come to that in a minute. And you hold them together, leaving a small cavity. And in the cavity, you actually fill it up with a gel, liquid gel or liquid or you know, typically a gel. And then you will have some suspended particles which respond to the electric field. So when the electric field is applied, as shown in the diagram, the particles get aligned. And when they get aligned, uh, little, little pores end, end up opening. It's like electrophoresis. And then the light passes through that, right? And when you just pull off the voltage, then because of the Brownian motion, they get randomly distributed. And again, they block the light. And people have applied such technologies, uh, even in automobiles, as shown in this picture here. And the most popular example, uh, you know, people are really trying to push hard this particular technology. This is a, a PDLC, uh, where we rely on the uh, liquid crystals in order to respond to the electric field. So here we have, again, glasses coated with conduct electrical conducting layers. And in the middle, we have filled in with uh, uh, polymer matrix in which liquid crystals are dispersed. Liquid crystals have this tendency to quickly respond to light, and also they can effectively change the refractive index of the medium. So you can make the refractive index match with the the host polymer, or you can put it off. Accordingly, you can have the glass becoming, uh, you know, something which can scatter light, what we call the translucent state, or it can simply transmit light uh, with much ease. So PDLC devices also uh, are nowadays quite popular. These are voltage-driven devices, as you can see, they are fast switching devices. Uh, they look like actually, uh, you know, just animation or something, but the, truly I have seen uh, glass panes working like that. The last in this uh, literature cover is uh, is, is um, electrochromic uh, type of device. And if you have traveled by the Boeing uh, uh, Dreamliner, you really get to see a window which doesn't have a plastic shutter, but it, you can toggle the switch and control the light entry uh, uh, from outside, right? So here, three states are shown. Uh, this is actually, again, you have uh, two glasses and uh, coated with the electrical conducting layers. In, in the middle, you have, uh, you know, electrolyte and, uh, you know, charge donating, accepting layers and all that. And then basically what you're doing is you're taking electrochromic material like WO3, typically it's WO3. And you can, you, the moment you dope it, it has one color, you pull out the doping, what's called as intercalation and deintercalation. the color goes on changing. And that is being done with the uh, electric uh, field application as shown here. So all these are electrical devices in some sense, and they also make use of uh, large area, like wh whatever area you want window, the entire area is actually to be made of glass coated with the electrically conducting layer. And these are really challenging aspects as I'll be uh, dealing with. Let's look at quickly the parameters here. So here we have the 
you know, how the IR blocking is. I mean, these are some set of parameters an industry would be looking for whenever we say that we have made a new device. People would rather ask all these parameters, how are they, uh, how they are going with it. And again, because of shortage of time, I will only point out one or two points here. People look for huge on-off ratio, right? And you can see here anywhere between 10 to 80 is the transmittance in the visible range. And uh, electrical supply, these are all like typical domestic supplies. Important parameters here, power required in the on state. So to run these kind of devices, I just mentioned that only thermochromic doesn't need, but it has limited usage. But otherwise, all known devices require power to run. To keep it in the on state, you have to be spending a few watts per meter square continuously. Otherwise, it will actually uh, come to the off state automatically. So this also has been a very discouraging aspect uh, in the industry. There are new things like uh, curtain effect. You know, you have a glass, unless you have patterned the electrode itself internally, otherwise the whole glass comes transparent or opaque, okay? But you want to have the way normally we operate a curtain, either going horizontally or vertically, such effects are absent. And uh, so having said all this, I just want to ask one question. Why, you know, there's so many technologies, I only covered three, four of them. Uh, why we don't see them in our domestic setup? Ours means not only in India, but across the globe in a domestic setup, for example, where people really look for low cost. The reason is the manufacturing cost. This is one of them. And secondly, the operating energy, as I just pointed it out. You know, you don't want a window which consumes energy and, you know, you have to be, to keep it uh, open or closed, uh, uh, you have to spend energy. So that is something discouraging. I, 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 it's not that I have really uh, solved these problems, but uh, our efforts I would like to put forth now. First, going by the uh, manufacturing cost. So a few uh, minutes I'll deal with now how we have come around to, to address this manufacturing cost. Where is the manufacturing cost? All these modern technologies make use of not an ordinary glass, this glass is coated with an electrically conducting layer. And that electrically conducting layer is nothing different from when you uh, take your smartphone, the top glass is also coated with a similar layer. So you basically you're asking now, the kind of glass, what uh, the smartphone technology uses, the same glass has to now come around here next to me uh, in the window, right? So you can imagine the cost rise there. In fact, it, uh, somewhere I have read the estimate that around 30% of the smartphone cost is associated with that electrically conducting layer, which goes on the glass. Without that uh, conducting layer, uh, the phone will not understand the, the whatever electrical signal you want to pass on, like the touch screen itself doesn't work. So getting a transparent conducting electrode at a much reduced cost is the game. And then again, there are uh, more than a dozen technologies uh, around and uh, I'm not going to deal with them now. I'll just, um, get into the topic to tell you what we have done in the lab. But just before that, what actually is the material which we end up using with respect to smartphone or uh, you know even internet TVs and whatnot. So what is this material which makes a glass uh, so well electrically conducting? Normal glass doesn't conduct at all. It's a wide band gap semiconductor. Whereas uh, what we use here in these devices is highly conducting. The reason is it is coated with what is called as ITO, Indian, indium uh, tin oxide. So this is indium oxide doped with the tin. What it does is, a bit of physics here, when you have the indium oxide, there's a band gap of around uh, uh, three plus electron volt. And whenever you dope an oxide, uh, usually oxides are all carrying a band gap anywhere around three electron volt to you know, six, seven electron volt. So indium oxide, like zinc oxide and all, has a small band gap. Whenever you dope this uh, indium uh, three plus, with SN4+, plus, it actually leaves out some electrons. And the beauty is all these extra electrons which have come into the indium oxide matrix, they go to the conduction band of the indium oxide. Okay, this is, the, this is rather very, very unique example. Uh, if you take any other thing, normally when you dope an oxide with uh, some other uh, uh, metal ion, the, it ends up uh, creating states in the middle. And that all adds to, uh, gives color to the glass. It doesn't help actually. So you need a, a layer which remains as transparent as the glass itself, but at the same time brings in uh, the, the electrical uh, conductance as desired. Uh, 
So ITO is, is a key thing here. And uh, since 1960s, processes have been extremely optimized how to make use of ITO on glass and, and, and actually derive these uh, uh, electrical conducting glasses. A lot of technical limitations are there. Uh, the, the, all these limitations can tell you why you still do not have a flexible TV or a flexible uh, smartphone and all that, but I will not get into those details. But a good ITO can give you anywhere around 90% visible transparency and a sheet resistance of around 10 ohm per square. And these are commonly available. What's wrong with them? The wrong thing is the cost of indium. Indium is almost as expensive, as uh, less abundant as silver is. And uh, silver, uh, we use, remelt it, make jewelries, make vessels, reuse again. But we don't do the same thing with indium. The moment my phone is old, I just throw it. There is no easy way of recovering the indium itself. And that has been the big concern uh, uh, because indium uh, is depleting uh, on the earth uh, surface. So people have to look for alternate technologies. As I said, there are lots of technologies. I will not get into those details. I'll just come to uh, home front now and tell you what we have done uh, in the laboratory. What we have made is actually, um, instead of working with the continuous coating, we are satisfied with bringing in fine wire meshes on a given surface. These fine wire meshes, they're so fine that uh, uh, just with naked eye, you cannot make out. You have to put the uh, system under a microscope to see these wires. And we have to have this mesh of wires which are produced with, in a very, very affordable way. That's the biggest challenge, actually. So there are, again, many ways of doing it, including lithography and all. But what we relied is on a very natural process, what is called a, a cell-forming templating method. And uh, this is something which we have to discover ourselves. I think we were almost the pioneers, along with one or two groups in the world, who have contributed to this work uh, uh, way back uh, six, seven years ago. And the example, in this example, what I'm showing you, we have actually some acrylic resin dispersion. And this is like a colloidal dispersion. You coat it on a piece of glass. And having coated it on glass and allowing it to dry, it comes with some solvent. And once the solvent goes away, these are all desiccation cracks, which get formed are the desiccation cracks. And as they get formed, they get interconnected as well. So one should be able to control the width of them, the thickness of them, interconnection, the footprint itself, so many things one should be able to control. And having done that, you, you, you have formed a template to bring in the metal inside, okay? So here I have shown one example of this uh, cleavage here. This is a crack opening here. Um, you have so much of room to fill in metal here, uh, but it is hardly one micron wide. Actually, we have gone down to around 100 nanometer width cracks. And there's so much of crack for this, which is a lot of fun, and we have done in the past. So what we do is to actually keep the film thickness at the threshold below which actually the film doesn't crack at all and realize very, very fine cracks. And so that's important because we want to deal with very fine wires, not uh, and also dense wires, which do not stop the light, by the way, because they're all almost of the uh, wavelength, you know, width is almost uh, comparable to the wavelength of light. And our interest in cracks actually go on. And recently also we did some work and uh, this is related to how the cracks actually get formed. Can we categorize them into different generations? Is, you know, define a hierarchy in them based on space and time, how they develop. So there are interesting aspects one could be looking at. And uh, we are very keenly interested, even after having published two dozen papers, uh, more than that in this line. And we also have hold a couple of patents. Well, where we are. So usually you know when such activity goes on in a laboratory and we end up publishing working with uh, students and collaborators and about not and also having a good uh, r and d division r and d cell to help with we can go on patenting as well but the game should not stop there and uh, since uh, this was truly my, my passion i thought i'll spare some more time to take it forward uh, you know along the translational paths and see where we go uh, you know, Buddha has said it is better to travel well than to arrive. So I realized there's a lot of fun in actually doing the translational activity. And we have taken this uh, forward. And in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'll try to show you what we have done uh, in the last uh, recent years, three, four years or so. <clears throat> well, though there have been lots of attempts with different, different uh, partners and industries, let me just focus on one. 
and this is uh, in uh, partnership with uh, kishor joshi ji naapi ko bhejana ha theek hai thanks aapko this is uh, joined by our uh, industry friends uh, from hindavac which is a bangalore based company and uh, uh, this project was supported by nano mission government of india and what we did was to uh, define uh, we, we through this project actually we have achieved pr production of uh, one square feet area uh, glass coated with uh, our kind of uh, uh, you know solution method that is the fine wire mesh across and um, uh, project partners are mentioned there thanks to all of them for very active participation in fact uh, i must mention thanks to professor sood he, he also mentored a couple of times uh, during the project execution <clears throat> i have defined the process here you can see here the crackle precursor is spray coated so this is the one square foot uh, uh, substrate this is glass and glass itself uh, goes through some cleaning and all after that we coat it with the precursor and uh, Uh, give some minutes, few minutes of time drying. Uh, one can we do it under controlled atmosphere, and then we have the cracks getting formed, and uh, then we do the metal deposition and lift up. There are so many parallel ways of doing metal deposition. It's not one. Uh, you know, typically one can be relying on physical vapor deposition, thermal thermally heating a metal. We normally do aluminium. We have tried out uh, all sorts of metals, but uh, because of the cost consideration, here we stick to. Uh, aluminium and the uh, electron microscope uh, picture is shown here these are the fine networks the white lines are all the fine aluminium wires and so these could be anywhere around few micron wide and you see the interconnectivity the here this polygonal region in the middle is all glass so it would be non conducting actually only the current would flow along these metallic conduits right but it can spread over from one region to the another without break is very hard to find a wire which is not connected at all such is the optimization of our process and if you apply a field on one side actually you get to see current coming on the other side and uh, but you know to address the insulating part in the middle there are many again many other solutions one thing we did was to actually bring in uh, chemically sprayed uh, sno2 layer sno2 is very very affordable material and if you coat it around 100 nanometer or so Uh, the whole region becomes uh, uh, uniform and uh, electric field also tends to become quite uniform and so having done this 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 was like a technology project we we were serious in comparing uh, how do we compare with ito and the plot shown here you can see it all depends on what sheet resistance you are looking at if you are if you don't care about the sheet resistance if you are working with some 100 ohm per square and all it doesn't matter you can go to ito or our type of mesh but moment you want very low sheet resistance uh, if you are conscious of what power is being consumed by the device and you want to have electrical coating which is having very fine conductivity and then uh, it's better to use our kind of device because of the cost difference you can see here the cost difference can shoot up to around 90% when you are working with around 1 1 ohm per square or so and so the technology project uh, i should say was rather successful and uh, through this project we set up actually a semi pilot plant this is in the campus of the center for uh, nano and soft matter sciences and this is a cl glass cleaning setup uh, and a spray coater and oxide deposition metal deposition so on so forth and this is the power of working with an industry you know they were our project partners and so today it can churn out a, a few dozens of these glass plates for any type of prototyping and you name the study we have done it looking at uh, you know the scotch tape test environment heat test and pencil hardness test because industry does demand lots of these tests in collaboration with uh, our industry partner we have to carry out lots of these studies and uh, i mentioned about one this uh, mm, the sno2 coating on top actually it brings in additional properties uh, that is it, the glass becomes extremely scratch proof and it can also stand up to 500 degrees centigrade whereas uh, normal glass actually becomes quite soft uh, at such temperatures well so that is the success uh, story <clears throat> i must spend uh, a minute or two just to highlight i shouldn't miss this that is it the substrate can be anything actually not necessarily glass and we have extended the studies through other projects this is the indo german project wherein we looked at uh, the whether the fine metal mesh can be brought on a polyethylene sheet 
Okay, so this is the uh, not polythene. This is PET, and uh, uh, scaling up of this was done with our German collaborators. Uh, and uh, you can see here, uh, this is a, a piece cut out from a big roll, four kilometer roll. It's a roll-to-roll -roll process. That's what they developed actually. And uh, you pull it out, and you can see the two aluminium bars running across the sheet. And when you put a multimeter and measure across, you'll be measuring around just 50 ohms or so. So this is whole thing is now filled up with uh, aluminum fine mesh, which we don't see it. And uh, this can be uh, taken to develop uh, transparent heating foils and some automobile parts and whatnot. This uh, has uh, reached a successful uh, technology translation. Well, having made uh, whether on glass or whether on uh, the uh, flexible substrates, we have real, realized ourselves in the laboratory, whatever devices people have real, realized uh, with respect to ITU, whether it is EMI shield or uh, making strain sensors. There are lots of new concepts also have come around in the laboratory. And again, I will not be getting into those details. Well, again, a touch screen, we have made lots of different varieties of touch screens and I will not get into uh, those details. Yeah. So coming to the crux of the matter, how did this glass, special glass, containing this aluminum metal mesh, how we could be using it for creating smart window applications, right? So again, the process is shown here. Uh, we're creating the aluminum mesh and then coating it with SNO2. That will not only make it scratch proof, optically much more appealing, it will also protect the aluminum mesh against lots of uh, you know, chemicals and all that, which one would be using in, in device fabrication. So we first tried out this kind of a system for the conventional PDLC technology. I already mentioned that uh, you can have two glasses and liquid crystals dispersed in between. And when you apply the voltage, it can actually switch, right? This is off state when the device is in the translucent state and in the on state, it becomes quite transparent. And here it is in the video. Uh, it should switch now, yes. And you can, this is actually real time video. So you can see the uh, switching is of the order of uh, within 100 milliseconds. We have measured that and it's pretty fast. Applied voltage was around 80% and transparency modulation around green light is around 94%. So this is across quite a large area. And uh, one can go on expanding. Our limitation is that we cannot be dealing with the larger glasses because our uh, cap you know, capability of our equipment is limited. And at best, we can go for a, a foot by foot. And so instead, what we did was to actually create a window structure with uh, this is like a Victorian style window. You can see here a pixelized uh, uh, glass arrangement here, uh, four by three or something like that. And at will, you can actually turn on, turn off, right? So when turn on, it becomes transparent. And um, you, you, you can actually program it and you can play around with it. So these kind of concepts we could extend to uh, replacing the ITO coating with our aluminum mesh and SNO2 type of hybrid layer coating on the glass and make it equally functional. And then comes the game of uh, creating uh, electrochromic uh, type of devices. As I mentioned earlier, the popular material used here is WO3. And again, uh, there are several patents and all that, how to make WO3 sputtered way, solution method, and so on and so forth. We didn't discover anything new here. We just used the existing methods and brought in coatings. Of course, there are a lot of optimization steps are required. The most challenging aspect with respect to bringing such layers on top is not to perturb the fine metal mesh, which is below. So in this sense, the SNO2 coating does help to a great extent. And having made that, you can see sort of charge discharge kind of cycles, intercalation, deintercalation kind of cycles. And uh, the response is of the order of few seconds. That's what is expected for electrochromic uh, devices. And here is a uh, uh, glass coated with such material. And you can see the three electrode system, the color is quite appealing, like it becomes completely dark. And uh, we have first studied cycling aspect with respect to them in the three electrode system and having convinced ourselves that uh, uh, the optimizations and all are appropriate then we have translated that to a full-blown device which is a two terminal device and this is a one uh, square foot device uh, you can see here by application of uh, just around two volt uh, it actually becomes colored 
and it takes about just about around two minutes to do so and um, you can also make it transparent again by applying the voltage and opposite polarity you may recall that if you're trying to toggle the switch in the dreamliner it also takes similar time actually it goes with the chemistry of intercalation and deintercalation and nothing much can be done about it that's also the limitation of this particular technology which is electrochromic technology and coming back to the set of parameters here, I already mentioned that though PDLC, electrochromic and suspended particle are around as technologies, as uh, products, uh, you know, PDLC is coming uh, hugely in lots of different markets, including on flexible films. You can actually buy uh, films which are PDLC active and uh, you can laminate it on glass. That is also possible now, uh, but cost is the one which is prohibitive. And electrochromic, I told you, it can become <clears throat> uh, window pane for uh, aeroplane or things like that, but not on ordinary vehicles. Suspended particles find some limited applications in, in big setups and also in automobiles. And the, the manufacturing cost is one. Probably if, we, if people adopt our kind of method, then maybe cost can be uh, worked out in a different way and it can become more affordable. But yet one more parameter remains to be worked out, which we did not address so far, isn't it? That is to do with the power required to keep the device. These are all devices actually. To keep a smartphone working, we need energy. To keep a TV working, we need energy. Similarly, to keep the window working, we need energy. And that is not acceptable. In a larger picture, probably it is not acceptable. It is not good for the environment. And also it can add to a lot of cost in any sense it's not good so is there a way actually we can circumvent it and make a glass work in a way it doesn't require energy at all and there have been ideas in the literature <clears throat> this is a very fancy idea what's called microfluidics we all know microfluidics that in small narrow channels which could be of the order of a few micron wide a few nanometer wide would people pass liquid and study their behavior and off late there is a tendency to look at how this passing of the liquid does control the light transmission, particularly when whatever liquid you're passing, it can have a refractive index matching or not matching with the, 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 the matrix or the substrate itself, in this particular case, glass. So <clears throat> the, this is schematic which is illustrating that if you take a frosted glass, frost, I mean, um, not by temperature or anything condensate and all, it is actually the glass made into a translucent state because of its roughness or whatever and it's available in the market and uh, if you look at uh, glass air interface light doesn't transmit in fact this kind of glasses we use everywhere right i should have brought a picture here and <clears throat> with, because of that kind of roughness uh, incident light from outside or from within uh, it ends up scattering okay light doesn't go uh, uh, in a collated way. And because of that extra scattering which comes about, you will not be able to form it. Please. So this, there is some disturbance, please. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kunkan, you have to unmute yourself. How is it now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, uh, did I miss a lot? No, no. OK, OK. So uh, I was just telling you about making the glass surface rough and uh, creating scattering centers so that <clears throat> it ends up being translucent. This is a very common product available everywhere. And if you bring in now uh, uh, liquid uh, with it, is to remove the air, bring in a liquid which is refractively you know, index matched on top of that. So it fills in all the roughness and effectively glass uh, becomes again uh, transmitting, right? In the absence of these uh, scattering centers. And that's what is uh, being... Uh... See, again, I got stuck, uh, no count. I had to unshare and share again the slide. Slide is not moving. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most also speaking. Oh, 
are you able to see the slide are we no slide is not changing so uh, you can escape your Maybe some sound transport yeah that is from, yeah can you please escape button in your uh, laptop or i did does that it, yeah it doesn't help uh, mm. Ah, uh, now it works. Yeah. What is working? I unshared actually. No, no, it's unshared. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'll share it again. Sorry for the interruption. Ah, how is it? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there have been uh, publications in the recent past. Now you can see advanced science in 2017, where people take a typically polymer kind of substrate and etch. Uh, microfluidic channels through that and then sandwich and pass a liquid which is reflectively matching and then you can create uh, uh, such substrate this is the experimental one you can show you can see here on the top uh, once the liquid is filled in the whole thing uh, the the striation itself disappears the pattern itself disappears uh, as if uh, liquid is not there and no roughness is there such concepts are around. I'm not too sure about this bottom picture, whether it is uh, sort of simulated or real one, but these ideas are around in the last uh, uh, few, few years. What we have done is to actually take it to the next level. And here is the video showing a big glass pane, typically used in a domestic setup. Uh, and then uh, we have created our own way of uh, making these uh, microfluidic channels and filled in liquid, wherein once the liquid goes in, the uh, translucent nature disappears. And once the liquid is pulled out, again, the translucent nature reappears. Uh, in the video is not that clear. I'll go to the stills here. So you have the translucent state wherein there is no liquid filled in. Liquid is all in a small cavity here below. And there's a toggle switch here with a little pump attached to it. And once the pump is activated, this is very ordinary pump. And uh, the liquid is uh, starts filling in now. As liquid fills in, that portion of the sandwich device becomes transparent. It is so faithful that you just can't make out that there is a liquid there. And we call this as curtain effect. Top is translucent, bottom is transparent. And if you go on pushing liquid further, you can see that the entire glass pane has become transparent. And what the video, what I showed was a little faster uh, to save time, but actually the going up can be within a few seconds, but coming down can take a little longer. Recently, we have addressed these issues also, uh, but uh, let me not get into those details. Yeah, so now come to the comparison table. I was particularly focusing on one aspect that is about the power required to run the device. I put it zero here, right? These kind of devices do not need energy at all. Just that when you're doing the switching, you have to decide whether you want to do it manually, like a manual pump or something, or you want to assign some electricity to that. That's the only cost. It's only to switch the state, you may require some power, but not to retain the state itself. Otherwise, it's an excellent device. It is much appreciated everywhere. We have shown it in various expos and all that. And uh, importantly, we have here the curtain effect, which is absent in other technologies at all. And having done so, uh, we did talk to lots of industries, and particularly one industry took a lot of interest. This is one of the global players, St. Gobain, and uh, their uh, St. Gobain uh, in, from Chennai uh, took a lot of interest and they have been working with us. We are into a collaborative project now. And uh, these kind of big, big glass panes are now being made in their setup. And they're examining uh, the uh, field, conducting the field test and whatnot. So this also is almost reached its uh, technology translation path. And uh, we are so glad about that. And having done that, the next fun is actually can we combine certain of these technologies? I'll just take one more minute. Um, yeah, that is uh, having made the microfluidic device with the liquid which we are filling in, can we now have a liquid, a refractive index matching liquid, uh, rather than ordinary liquid, can we have an electrolyte doing the job? And also we need to bring in uh, electrically conducting layers on these roughened glasses, okay? So these are challenging aspects, but it is very heartening to share with you that we have an entirely dedicated team for that. We have a new project from uh, the technology development activity from uh, DST, which has been granted. In the last few months, we have started this activity. And uh, I'm not, I don't have slides here to show you the initial data, but our plan is to actually achieve 
functional glass windows with lots of the different possibility, with different colorations, curtain effects. You know, when you want, uh, you don't have power, you don't have to worry, you can rely on the microfluidic aspect. When you do have power, you have the fun of bringing some extra uh, coloration to the glass, whatnot. So all these things would be a possibility uh, in the next two years or so. Here also we have an uh, industry partner working with us. I think that almost comes to the end of my presentation. And uh, as you can imagine, this has been an activity for the last uh, uh, six, seven years, starting with initial PhDs focusing on, uh, you know, here a bunch of people are shown, uh, focusing on um, how the cracks form, how to optimize them for our application, whatnot. And then uh, we also had external collaboration, solar cells and making heating foils and all uh, with industry uh, in Germany and also University of Bereit and uh, crack modeling also we have had colleagues who are working with who worked with us and again colleagues from sense dr prasad dr gita who helped us make pdlc devices and a whole bunch of people including dr ashtosh singh uh, who is a project scientist now uh, working with us on this so several funding agencies have uh, are listed out here i must acknowledge the generous funding we received in the past and even now uh, and so uh, we should be extremely grateful to all of these people and so uh, thank you for your kind attention and i hope i just finished on time and i'll be happy to take uh, questions thank you very much yeah thank you very much professor kulkarni uh, for a should wonderful should i unshare talk. now sorry should i unshare or will it be um yeah if there are uh, yeah if there are questions maybe maybe yeah you can keep it right now for a few ah. seconds yeah few ah. few minutes Okay. Yeah, once again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kulkarni, for a wonderful talk. I think let's thank the speaker for a wonderful talk. Uh, so now the session is open for question and answer, though I don't see anything posted here uh, in the chat box. Uh, but if there are questions, please raise your hand uh, uh, or you can unmute and you can ask the question. Yeah, Professor Kulkan, just uh, yes, please. Uh, this connectivity of cracks is it controllable? Uh, like, uh, what will be there? Must be a some way to define the connectivity, right? Some mathematical definition might be there. I don't know this because that is what is defining the percolation path for you, correct? Because if you're uh, only few connections, then you will have high resistance. Otherwise, you will have more. So is there a way to control the connectivity or the percolation uh, beyond, let's say there is a percolation threshold and you want to go much more than that. Is there a parameter to quantify and control? Sir, the there is one paper in 1977, one PRL paper is there, which actually addressed this particular aspect. Okay. And connectivity of the crack. So we have made use of those. I, this was a calculation-based paper. And so what it talks about is when you are dealing with these uh, desiccating layers, these are essentially colloidal in nature. And how the uh, strain is released there. Right? So if we have uh, colloidal particles, which individually are, individually are very hard, mechanically hard, and then there, you know, the... Uh, uh, it, 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 how the interaction between the particles and interaction between particle and the substrate and also with the solvent, all these come into play. And so what is recommended is to use particles which are not too soft, then the layer doesn't crack at all. Or if you have hard particles, then you will have very wide cracks getting formed and many of them remain un unconnected. You have to have a balance of the softness of these colloidal particles. And so it's only we searched, searched, which could be most well suiting. And through microscopy and all, we satisfied ourselves that we do have such particles. So I showed one actually, uh, one micrograph where, um, I don't know, it's not easy to go, go back and all that. In microscopy picture, you can see the particles, they are deformed and getting packed. And that's the most important aspect. Otherwise, you simply have the uh, entropically arranged particles and they're useless for this purpose. Okay. No, no, because what happens, uh, otherwise you may have the whole layer peeled off instead of the cracks. 
Absolutely. Be, so before it's a way to release the stress. That's exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Chat. There are five of them. What? What they are? I mean, have you? No, oh no. These are uh, before beginning your talk. Achha, 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 testing. Yeah. I have a technical question, Professor Kulkarni. Uh, usually, aluminium get oxidized. So, do you put some capping layer for to have a stability of this? Uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, aluminium, uh, uh, aluminium is very unique. Rather, that is, it does form oxide around thirty nanometer or so, yeah. and it this is a very hard oxide, mm -hmm. and it is uh, the the uh, growth is limited. So it grows up to 30 nanometer in ambient air, and there it stays. I see. So it Unless you make effort to remove again, the fresh layer doesn't form. So it, rather, it becomes a protective layer on top. Uh -huh. OK, that is your question. Yeah, yeah. please, uh, Dr. Eraibe, yeah. am I pronouncing? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I'm uh, Dr. Eraya from uh, Bangalore University. Uh -huh. Hello, sir. Please. Sir, you have uh, you what type of glass you have used uh, in your experiment? So, is it a vanadium glass or borate glass or silicate glass? Yeah, uh, in terms of glass, we have uh, done lots of variations, and now we are focusing on glass. Yeah. What industry is interested in? Because they want a specific mechanical mm -hmm. property, you know, and also the optical transmittance property. So they are very sensitive about what glass can be made used for the device itself. So we just get from them and use. They are typically uh, borosilicate glasses. Borosilicate glasses. One could be using any type of glass. Okay. So you said that uh, vanadium glass is very. Uh, no, I didn't uh, say it vanadium is a glass. very active glass. No, no sorry. Yeah. See, what I what I said is vanadium oxide. It is a thermo yeah, yeah. active material. Okay. okay. Oxide. So uh, if you want to make thermochromic type of functional glass, people bring in extra vanadium oxide layer on top. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any raise hand? Uh... Yeah, if still, if there are, please uh, raise your hand and you can directly ask, uh, unmute and ask a uh, speaker. Somebody uh, wrote a comment. Uh, are they are they able to unmute themselves, or uh, you have to enable that? Uh, so after the talk, everybody can unmute. Okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, so there was a one comment, maybe I can read out. Uh, Dr. Kabita, I don't know where is she from. She said, excellent talk and lot of information, Professor Kulkarni. Sir, thank you, KSTPC, for the wonderful session. Okay, really okay. great. Okay, I think I'll just say thank you once again. I will have to go now, but uh, thank you once again, Mr. Kulkarni. Very nice thank talk. You, thank you, thank you, sir, for making it to. Thank you for joining. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, Ninja, if there are uh, any yeah. other questions, we can uh, give it yeah. back to a lot of people are thanking Mr. Kulkarni, saying it's excellent talk. Oh my God! Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Messages are coming. Uh, yeah. I think we can give it back to K steps to formally conclude. Absolutely, that. absolutely. So yeah, I'll hand over to Dr. Venkatesh now. I'll stop sharing now. Yeah, you can stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Giridhar Kulkarni sir, for your stimulating lecture and uh, Professor Anindya Das for coordinating the Q&A session. Now I request Dr. R.T. Venkatesh, scientist, guest steps to give vote of thanks. Uh, distinguished dignitaries, invitees, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to everyone. At the outset, it gives me immense pleasure to propose a word of thanks for all those who have participated in the inaugural talk of Bangalore India Nano Talks 2022. I would like to express our sincere gratitude and immense thanks to our honorable minister for higher education, electronics, IT, BT, and science and technology and skill development, 
uh, of government of Karnataka, Dr. C. N. Ashwath Narayan, sir, for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, sir. We are extremely grateful to Bharat Ratna, Professor C. N. R. Rao, sir, honorary chairman of Vision Group on Nanotechnology, honorary president of GNC ASR, and Linus Pauling Research Professor for his constant support for initiatives like Bangalore India Nano Talks 2022. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Our profound thanks to Professor Ajay Kumar Sud, sir, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India and Member Vision Group on Nanotechnology for addressing the participants in spite of his busy schedule. Thank you very much, sir. I would like to extend our sincere gratitude and heartfelt thanks to Dr. E. V. Ramadreddy, sir, Additional Chief Secretary to Government, Department of Electronics, IT, BT, and Science and Technology, Government of Karnataka for his constant support for this initiative and for addressing the participants. Thank you very much, sir. We are extremely grateful to the mentor of this program, Professor Navakant Bhatt, sir, Chairman of Vision Group on Nanotechnology, Government of Karnataka, and Dean, Division of Interdisciplinary Sciences, IAC. Thank you very much, sir. We wish to express our sincere thanks to Professor uh, Giridhar U. Kulkarni, sir, President of GNCSR and member Vision Group on Nanotechnology uh, for today's excellent talk, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I also extend thanks to Shri A.B. Basuraj, sir, Director and Managing Director, KSTEP, Department of Electronics, IT, BT, and Science and Technology. Government of Karnataka. Thank you very much, sir. Our special thanks to Professor Anindya Das, convener of Bangalore India Nano Talks 2022, and Associate Professor Department of Physics, IAC, for his valuable guidance in planning the Bangalore India Nano Talks. I also thank all the distinguished invitees and participants of this program. I thank Dr. Rohit Kumar and other colleagues from KSTEX for their uh, support in organizing this program. Uh, we look forward to your continued participation in the Bangalore India Nano Talks 2022. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. <coughs> thank you. Thank you thank all. You, thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Starting <coughs> with this we end this session. Maybe just one announcement. Uh, very soon we'll be uh, announcing our next speaker and about the next talk, which will be happening uh, first or second week of August uh, uh, 2020. Uh, so very soon we'll be advertising for the next talk. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you all. Thank yeah, you thank all. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Good, sir. Bye bye.